So, uh, hi everyone. Very glad to be here today. Today we are going to talk about IBUS, which is a um, pretty cool Python library that can help you to transition from single node pandas code to distributed data frames. So very important this legal disclaimer, basically saying we're not giving financial advices, and uh, that should be pretty obvious. Um, so target audience, why should you be interested? So if you like pandas, but want to analyze a larger data set, or maybe you're interested in distributed data frames, but you don't know which one to pick because there's so many these days, or maybe you want to just write your code once and have it run faster and more scalable without making code changes. If any of these seems re re uh, relevant to you, this is, this is a talk for you. Before we start, just a quick introduction. My name is Li Jing. I'm a software engineer working at Two Sigma. Yeah. And we, uh, we're working on a modeling tools team, which, which we build platforms using open source technologies. I've, I've been mostly a, uh, working on a lot of open source projects. Uh, my, my work include working on a Apache Spark, and uh, I, I guess that's pretty, should be pretty familiar to most of the people here. Apache Arrow is, a, is an open source library that, that, is, um, that delivers high performance, in column, uh, high performance in memory data format. And Flint is a uh, time series library on top of Apache Spark. And today we're going to talk about IBIS. And uh, this is my colleague Hongji. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Hanji. I'm also a software engineer at Two Sigma, and I work with Lee, and mostly focused on building out distributed compute capabilities and using open source tools like Apache Spark. So, let's start the talk. I want to start the talk with a common data science task. This is some pandas code, and it should be pretty familiar to pandas users. Here we're just doing three very basic things. The first thing we're doing, we're just taking two columns, take the average, and assign it to a new column. The second line here, we're actually performing a group by rolling operation, which just takes, we group by key and take a three, uh, a three row rolling window, compute the main, and assign to a new column called feature two. And lastly, we're just doing a pretty straightforward group by aggregation. So this code is pretty straightforward. We, we all write code like this with pandas. We all like it. However, we, we, we're not so happy uh, when the code runs too slow. And why the code runs too slow? It can be a lot of reasons. For example, pandas is not really designed for large amounts of data, as we all know. And uh, it could also be that your machine doesn't have enough memory to hold all the data you want to you look at. Pandas is mostly a in-memory uh, library that doesn't really deal with uh, uh, on-disk data that well. And maybe you're not utilizing all the CPUs. Pandas is mostly, again, a single thread library for the most part. And now these days, you, 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 even your laptop has a lot, a lot of cores. And that is not being utilized. So your code runs too slow. So what do we do? We have to try a few things. We want, we want to make our code run faster or more or hold more mem or, or um, hold more data. So we're gonna try a few things. Well, use a bigger machine seems pretty easy these days. And uh, it's ha it actually has a very um, impelling reason to do that because uh, uh, that is it has very low human cost. And that's the reason why a lot of researchers really like to use big machines these days instead of looking for another, another um, tool or software because it's there's no code changes. It's very easy to just, just do that. However, it, is, it has a lot of um, limitations. For example, it has the same software limit, limitation that you, you still have with a smaller machine. Pandas is not very good at keeping copy uh, minimum, so Pandas sometimes makes unnecessary copies, and that can become a problem if you have large, uh, even if you have a large machine, that can become a problem. Pandas is single threaded, like I mentioned, and uh, that I mean you can make your code work by using a large, uh, larger machine, but it's probably not going to be very fast. So the the second thing we can try is you can we can try to use a generic way to distribute our code. Here I'm just giving a quick example of using Spark, and uh, what I'm basically doing is 
assuming I'm, uh, assuming I'm analyzing time series data, what I'm doing here is I'm taking my time range, which is, which is 20 years from 2000 to 2020, I split that by year, and I, sh I send out, um, I, se I, s I send out uh, the code to the cluster and have each node compute only for one year. So that's a pretty straightforward approach. A lot of us use that approach in our day-to-day -day life. The advantage, again, is it has very, well, minimum human cost. You still have to make a little bit of code changes. You have probably have to refactor your compute for year code to deal with one year at a time and do some stitching back. But it's not huge amounts of work. You can still use the majority part of your um, data analysis code. It's pretty scalable. You can shard the data into how many pieces you want and just use how many CPUs you want. And this approach also has disadvantages. The first being, it only works for embarrassingly parallel problems, which means it is on, it's a map-only uh, computation. So if you, if you remember what we, uh, the example we showed before, it, has, it actually has a window operation and an aggregation operation. So these operations are not very straightforward to parallelize using, using this approach. The window operation can have overlaps, and aggregation operation needs data from multiple shards. So it's not very straightforward how we can just directly translate. The boundary handling can be tricky. Like I said, window operation uh, needs to ha needs to be uh, ha needs to handle boundary boundary cases. And now, since we're using a distributed framework, now we are we are now we open ourselves to distributed fa failures. So the third thing we can try is to actually use a distributed data frame library. There are a couple of out there, Spark being a very popular one, Dask um, is another very popular one, Koalas, as we heard this morning, is, is, the, is a new player in this space. All this library, they all has, uh, has its own advantage and disadvantage. They're mostly, very, they're mostly pretty much scalable, so they're all designed for using large amounts of executors or workers. So it's, it's inherently scalable. However, by using this approach, you basically committed yourself to learn another API, which is a very high human cost. In a lot of cases, researchers don't really like to do that. And uh, it's not obvious which one to use, because like I mentioned, they all have different um, advantages and disadvantages. Combined with the high learning cost of, uh, the high human cost of learning an API, not being able to pick an obvious one becomes even a bigger problem. And again, you're open to distributed failures because you're using a distributed library. So what can we do? None of these seems very, well, easy to, to pick. All of them has problems. So what do we do now? So here I want to take a step back and, and, and look at what we actually want to achieve here. It's actually... If we look at the code, we're actually pretty happy about the way we express it. It's not that we want to you know, completely rewrite the code to be something different. We kind of just want to have the same code working, but with a, large, uh, with a larger data set and run faster. So that brings, us, that brings us to our problem. The problem is not how we express the computation. We're actually pretty happy about the code, but we're not happy about how the code is executed. However, a lot of the two of the three approaches we talked before involves code changes or involves how we rethink about our computation, which is not the problem here. So something seems to be wrong here. The next I want to talk about this pretty common principle called um, separation of concern. So from Wikipedia, in computer science, separation of concern is a design principle for separating computer programs into distinct sections, such that each section addresses a separate concern. How, how is this relevant to, to us? If we think again, we actually have two, two parts of the, um, the program here. The first part of the program express the computation. That's all the API we use. For example, the rolling, the rolling function, the group by function, the aggregation function. This is how we express the computation. And the second part is how we execute the computation. In, in our code example, both of these are, are pandas. So pandas serves as both the expression and execution. Here, 
so here again, we just to re, just, just to rethink this. The problem with pandas is not the expression part, but the execution part. We want to run the same code, but with in a more scalable way. So can we separate these two things, and maybe that can help us um, think about what we can improve improve it. And there's actually a great example of doing this. SQL is a way to express the computation independent of the execution. If we think about data analysis, SQL is very powerful because you can write SQL once, and if it's too slow on this database, you just change it to another database. This happens so much in, in the history of data science. We move from single NoSQL databases to distributed SQL databases. We move from Hadoop to Spark, with the, and that's all, all easy and possible because, because SQL is an is a expression layer independent of the execution layer. So here I wanna, I wanna think about, can we have something that is, very, that is like SQL, but for Python data, data analysis? I don't wanna ask you to go back to stop using pandas and using SQL, because that's, that's kind of crazy, but I want you to think about if you can achieve the same benefits of SQL, but in, in a Python library. So that brings the motiv motivation of the rest of the talk. Here's the outline of the rest of the talk. I'm going to introduce IBIS, which is a library designed to address the problem I, I raised, separation of concern. And uh, that's, that's just going to that. IBIS, high level. So IBIS is a Python library for data analysis. <coughs> data analysis. It's an open source library, and it started around 2015 by Wes McKinney. And later on, it, it, is worked by, it is worked on by a lot of top um, Pandas committers, including Wes McKinney, Philip Cloud, and uh, Jeff Reback, and a bunch of other people as well. So IBIS has mostly two components. The first component is the IBIS language, and it is the API that is used to express the computation. And the second part is IBIS backend. IBIS, back, IBIS backends are modules that translate the expressions into something that can be executed by different computation engines. So this maps to the two concepts we, uh, we talked about earlier, expression and execution. And currently, IBIS has a list of backends su supported, including Pandas backend, which, which uses uh, the, pa the Pandas library we all love. PySpark is a, new, is a new one, which, which is actually imp implemented by um, Mian Hongji. Re uh, it's a new contribution recently. And there's a couple of other ones, like BigQuery, Impala, and, uh, and uh, uh, some GPU databases. So IBIS language is basically two components. The first component is a table API. Table API the table API is very similar to a traditional SQL or pan, pandas um, kind of operation. You can do projection, filter, join, group by, sort, window aggregation. These are all pretty standard data um, analysis tools. And then that also, and and it also has extensions to traditional SQL methods. For example, as of join as a new addition to IBIS API that does that is very useful for analyzing time series data. And UDF is another ad addition to to the library that can that that, that can invoke native Python code uh, with the with the rest of the API. And IBIS expression is the intermediate representation that gets translated into uh, different backend code. Here is just a quick example of what that, what that looks like in, in, in actual code. So here I'm just calling a very simple projection. I'm adding a new column, which is the, uh, uh, which is some of the two other columns. And here's the uh, IBIS API to do it. And the, the second, I'm showing IBIS expressions using just the building visualization in IBIS. Here we have a table and we have a selection on top of it. So it's pretty straightforward. And IBIS backend takes the previous uh, expression and translates it into specific backend code. For, for example, the same mutate function will be translated into assign if you're using pandas backend, and it will translate into with column if you're using PySpark backend. So these are native um, backend code that's specific to, uh, these are native code that's specific to, to the backend. So with that, I'm going to get to Hanji to talking to more details. Thanks, Lee. Um, okay, 
So the next section is going to cover more about the IBIS expression language. Um, we talked at a high level what motivates IBIS and why um, it's maybe useful. So this section is really just going to focus on showing you how we might express the same transformation that we saw in pandas earlier, but with IBIS. So if you recall our earlier example in pandas, Lee talked through it and he said, the feature is computed by taking an average of two columns, feature two is computed by doing a rolling mean over the initial feature, and then we do some sort of aggregation on our second feature. So what would this look like in IBIS? Well, let's, do, uh, let's take it apart line by line and first cover the basic column selection and arithmetic expression. So we have this pandas code here on the right and in IBIS, it looks pretty similar uh, with some few differences. So first, we would call the table.mutate API that Lee introduced earlier. We're creating a new feature, and the rest of it looks pretty similar where we extract columns v1 and v2, add them together, and divide by two. Okay, so what does group by and windowed aggregation look like? Well, on the right-hand side, you see pandas code where we're doing a uh, group by key and we do a rolling average with a window size of three over our feature column. Well, in IBIS, it's pretty similar, but we construct an IBIS window. And in this case, the argument is not necessarily window size, but a preceding window bound. So we're doing current row and then looking back two rows. So it's equivalent of the rolling three. And we're gonna call table.mutate again to create a second column called feature two which is the mean over the initial feature given our IBIS window. And third, we had the group by aggregation in pandas. In IBIS, we call table.groupby, grouping by the same key, and we call dot .aggregate, um, calculating the min and max of our feature two column. So this is the overall translation. Um, so what the transformation would look like expressed in IBIS versus pandas. And it's not too different. But there's actually one important difference that we want to highlight, which is that in IBIS, these are table expressions and not actual data frames. So again, we want to highlight that there's a separation of concern. We're separating how we express what we want to do with executing it. So with our IBIS tables, um, they're expressions and not data frames. And in order to actually execute this on some data, I need to have a real real data in a backend that I can actually operate or execute these transformations on. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, so for this next section, let's look into how we might execute this on a backend. So in order to execute any IBIS expression, we need to have a backend specific IBIS client. In this case, uh, we have a PySpark client, which you can just create by calling ibis.pyspark.connect and passing a PySpark session. If you wanted a pandas client, it would just be ibis.pandas.connect. Or if you wanted an Impala client, you might do ibis.impala.connect, passing in the host and port of the Impala server, so on and so forth. So you kind of get the idea. Well, to access a table in a certain backend, you just call client.table and pass in the table name, which in this case is foo. What you get in return is a table expression, which we've stored in a variable called myTable. So for PySpark backend, for instance, I would just take the PySpark client and call PySpark client.table, pass in the name foo, which would hopefully re uh, refer to some data frame in my backend, and save that expression as my table. What I want to emphasize again is that my table here is just a table expression. It's not an actual data frame, but it refers to a PySpark table in the backend. Uh, the name of that table is foo, and we can see here the schema is that it has three table columns, key, v1, and v2, key being a string column, v1 and v2 being integer columns. If I actually want to execute this table expression and get back the data frame, I just call myTable.execute, which materializes the table expression into a pandas data frame that I can do other operations on if I choose to. So if you recall our table transformations earlier that I showed in IBIS, it's the same code. I just wrapped it in a function called transform that takes in a table expression and returns a table expression that has the transformed results. And I can actually apply that transform on my table and get a result table, which again is just an IBIS table expression until we execute it. And when I execute it, I'll get the result as a pandas data frame. So we kind of get the gist between the expressions, and then what happens when I execute those expressions on real data. Uh, 
Okay. Now that we've talked more about the IBIS language and executing it on a backend, let's focus specifically on the PySpark backend, which Lee mentioned is something that we've built over the past few months. So the PySpark backend is really uh, translating IBIS expressions, which can be represented as expression trees, into PySpark code that we can execute on PySpark data frames. And to show you a little bit more about how this works, let's go through the same example. Um, and I'll talk through kind of how we might express this in an expression tree and how that expression tree will translate into PySpark code. So first, if we look at the basic column selection arithmetic expression that we saw earlier, let's focus on this expression in particular, where we're adding two table columns and dividing by two. Well, this IBIS expression can be represented by this expression tree. If we start at the bottom, you'll see that the bottom node is a table node, so it refers to original PySpark table. We're extracting two table columns, v1 and v2. We add the two table columns together, and that's the left operand of the divide operation. And on the right side, we have the literal value 2. Well, when we translate this into PySpark code, we actually start at the top of the tree. So we take the division expression, and we have uh, IBIS translation code. So this is code from the IBIS, um, IBIS itself. And we have a method called compile divide that takes in a few arguments. The first is T, which is a PySpark translator. And the PySpark translator has a translate method that evaluates an IBIS expression into the corresponding PySpark object. We'll get back to this later, so remember that. EXPR is the IBIS expression to translate, so in this case, the division. And scope is a dictionary that caches results of previously translated IBIS expressions. So for example, if I accessed uh, the table column v1 multiple times, I don't want to have to compile that multiple times. I'll just look in my scope and find that I've translated it before, and I'll just use the same results. So in the meat of this compile divide code, we have this t.translate, um, the left-hand side of my oper operation and the right-hand side of my operation. And when I call t.translate on the left and right sides, which are each themselves IBIS expressions, it'll return to me the result as a PySpark column. And the division just happens by performing a straightforward PySpark column division. If I look carefully at what the left-hand side is, you'll see that the left-hand side is another IBIS expression that's referring to the addition. So addition is another binary operation, and the compile method for addition looks very similar. So the difference between the division and the addition is just that we're performing a PySpark column addition instead of division. Well, for the compile add, the left, hand op the left hand of this operation is a little bit different in the sense that it's not another binary operation, but it's actually a table column access. So in this case, the table v1. When we compile a column, the code looks slightly different, but essentially this operation has a field called name, which refers to the table name. And when I translate that, I'll get reference to the PySpark data frame. And then the table column, when you compile it, is just a simple PySpark column selection. More or less get the hang of it? OK. So next, let's do something a little bit more complicated, the group by and windowed aggregation that we saw earlier. I'm not going to show you all the IBIS translation code, because by now it's mostly just boilerplate. I'll show you directly what it translates to um, when we operate in the PySpark backend. So in the PySpark translation of this, the IBIS window just gets translated into a PySpark SQL window. You can see that it has the same uh, group by or partition by key. Um, it has the same ordering key. And the preceding equals two just translates to the rows between in PySpark, indicating uh, negative two. So back two rows from my current row, and the end of that window boundary is the current row. This rolling average over the window then just uses the native built-in PySpark SQL function mean of feature over the given PySpark window. And the table.mutate gets translated into a df.with column in PySpark. So that's the whole translation. Next, we had the group by and the aggregate, which looks actually pretty similar in PySpark. So the, the min and max expressions in IBIS can be translated into PySpark column expressions. So we use the built-in min and max uh, PySpark SQL functions. And the group by and aggregate get translated into df.group by the key 
and .ag in PySpark. So more or less straightforward, but there are a few more interesting examples that I want to touch on. And these examples help illustrate why a user might want to use IBIS and not worry about having to rewrite their code to run in Pandas versus PySpark or different backends, because there are some subtle tricky differences that we handle in IBIS that a user probably never wants to think about. So the first is uh, this rank function. So let's say we wanted to take the V1 column, so it was an integer column, if you remember, in our table, and just rank it over a given IBIS window. Well, in PySpark, <coughs> There is a built-in rank function in PySpark SQL library where you can pass in, uh, you can call f.rank over a PySpark window, but to get the same results as you might get if you were to run this expression on, let's say, a pandas backend, you had to handle subtle differences like this where you're casting the result to a long and handling some random off by one error. And the only reason a user would uh, figure this out would be if they ran their code in Pandas and then translated themselves and ran it in PySpark and found these subtle differences, if they found them at all. Uh, another example is if you wanted to perform not any on a Boolean column. Well, in PySpark, you'll find that there's no direct translation, and we actually have to negate the result of the built-in max function over this Boolean column. So it's not really intuitive at all. And a user who is doing something similar in Pandas might have to research or get familiar with PySpark enough to know that they could take advantage of this built-in function in this specific way. Okay, so now for the interesting part, which is we showed a lot of code in this presentation, and I'll actually show you uh, what it looks like to run it in a notebook. Okay, hopefully this is big enough for everybody to read. So the first cell here is just importing IBIS and some of the PySpark SQL um, utilities that I use. And in the second cell, what we have here is some setup that I did beforehand where I create a Spark session that we'll use to instantiate an IBIS PySpark client and initialize some of uh, the demo data that we'll use for this. Okay, here's where it gets interesting. So here's the original Pandas example. So it's the same Pandas code that was in the presentation earlier that's computing um, some feature columns, and then the result is the min and max of our second feature, feature two. So I just ran this here to show you that this is the expected result that we want for the rest of the um, demo. So using IBIS, we can define this transform function, which is the same one that we just saw in the slides, that's essentially expressing the same thing as my pandas code. But now that I've expressed it in IBIS, I can actually execute it on a PySpark backend or a Pandas backend pretty easily and seamlessly without changing any of my expression code. So to execute on a PySpark backend, I'll create a PySpark client by ibispyspark.connect and passing in the PySpark session that I had referenced to earlier. I'll get reference to our table and create the result by applying the transform on our table. And then I can compile my result into a PySpark data frame if I so want to, or I can execute it and also get the expression into a pandas data frame if I want to work with a pandas data frame moving forward. And you can see here that the results are the same as when I executed just in straight pandas. But with the advantage of expressing our transformation in IBIS is that I can execute seamlessly on PySpark or pandas without changing any of our original transform code. So if I want to then execute it on a pandas backend, all I have to do is create a pandas client. I'll get reference to the same table, and then I can apply the same transformation on that table, execute the result, and hopefully it should be the same. And they are. Awesome. So thanks, Hongji. Uh, with that, I think we're getting close to the end of the talk, so I just want to wrap up and give, uh, give you guys two takeaways. So first takeaway, I think it's very um, interesting and important to us is we really want to think this problem uh, in a way that we can in, in, uh, apply the separation of concern um, design principle. We really, we really want to separate expression and execution. And that, that can bring us a lot of flexibility in, ter in terms of which of the component we want to swap out. If we are unhappy about this particular execution, we just change it to something else without changing the code. So that's the whole point of IBIS. And the second point I, th I think is also interesting here is just 
is, is that don't limit yourself to only what you can use today. Before I've showed, you can use Spark, Desk, you can use Koalas today. However, there's a lot of th things going on in the, in the, in the, in the um, data analysis land that you might not be aware of or that might be um, available in the future. Aero Dataset is a library that Wes McKinney has been currently working on, it's focusing on single-node uh, single data frame API that, that is designed to, to be a replacement of um, Pandas. And Moling is an experimental library out of uh, UC Berkeley to um, provide another distributed data frame API. And QDF and Desk QDF is a, is a GPU data frame. So all these, they are, all these libraries, they are like, they're happening and a lot of people are working on it. And when, and when you want to use it tomorrow, you don't really want to rewrite all your code. So Ibis is a way to prevent yourself from having to rewrite your code in the future. That's, that's hopefully um, interesting to you. With that, we're, um, thanks for coming to the talk and we're open to questions. Hello. Um, thank you very much. So my first question, the only question is, uh, you've wrote all the code that makes the connection between uh, between PySpark and um, other distributive uh, packages, libraries. So when something new comes out, are you as two sigma or personally uh, are gonna write the connections to that or you expect the community to do that? So uh, Ibis is an open source project. And uh, to answer your question, most likely will be the users or the developer of that particular backend to to implement the, the backends. We implement the PySpark backends because we use that heavily at Two Sigma, so we are like, we are interested in using that. Is there any kind of, you know, as you do the translation between the, I guess the declaration and the backend execution, is there any optimization that happens? So like, you know, you're obviously going for distributed data frames. Mm -hmm. Like, is it just simply you're rewriting that declaration in SQL or do you ever try to break up the SQL into separate execution modules sort of parallel, something along those lines? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And our current approach is not to do any optimization and defer to the backend because I think the backend does a better job of executing it and optimization is a property of the execution. So if we do some, uh, Optimization there might not be useful or or even good. Um, that that answer your question. Yeah. I think also. I don't know if this is on. I think also at the same time though, when um, we're translating different backends, I think regardless of what backend it is, you do have to be smart about how you translate it because there are many different ways that you can express the same thing. So for PySpark, PySpark backend in particular, uh, we might choose to use, uh, let's say, Pandas UDFs over built-in Spark UDFs because that's more efficient in many cases since it's vectorized. So, yeah. Well, that was my second question, actually, is have you found any practical experience with a migration that would show whether or not know the IBIS version of the code would run better than a person trying to do the migration, right? So like if I were using a pandas data frame one day and I decided to rewrite it in BigQuery, right? Like I'm curious about whether or not people would do a better job than the framework. Do you have any metrics or data or anecdotal stories? Yeah, we, we currently don't unfortunately. <laughs> Well, um, so one of the challenges of converting pandas to PySpark code is not so much the, the difference in syntax, but um, the, the whole uh, paradigm around like lazy transformations and actions and how, um, you know, if you're not aware of it, you can do a group by and like a whole bunch of transformations and then you do a count right before you do a write and it actually does that shuffle twice, right? Um, which of course is very suboptimal because you're doing it twice. Um, so. Uh, did, does IBIS address that at all? Or, because like you showed it in a notebook, right? So like, um, it's very easy to think that if you don't have to change the syntax very much, that it runs the same way, that like you actually get a full data object every time you, uh, instead of a query plan. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think one 
sort of design principle of IBIS is it's lazy executed, and the reason for that is is really without without that design principle, it's really hard to separate uh, these two concerns. So it is it is kind of a gap between um, pandas users because pandas users are um, f used to the uh, e UI execution mode, and that that's just something I think going forward um, people have to. Um, I guess get used to. We have time for one more, two, one or two more questions. Any other questions? And, and yep. Thank you. Thanks. That's a very interesting project. Um, I noticed in your example, uh, which I get is a really simplified example. Uh, it seems like all of the work Python is doing is just helping you construct this abstract syntax tree for your your IBIS expression. Uh, and you're not really taking advantage of it being in Python until you get the data back out. So I'm wondering when, pe when people use it for larger projects, how much back and forth is there between actually using Python to do processing and doing all the processing in IBIS? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by do, uh, doing the processing in, in Python versus in Python? I'm sorry. Um, so in your example, all of the function calls in Python are just returning new IBIS nodes, right? Like there's no actual computation happening in Python. Correct. Um, so in a sense, you could have just written your own IBIS language that compiles directly to your IBIS syntax tree, right? It w you're not getting anything out of it being in Python. Does that make sense? Uh, what, what do you mean by writing your own IBIS thing? <laughs> um, maybe I should take it up with you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's sorry. That's, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's chat afterwards. All right, thank you very much. Everyone have a good day.